Welcome to the latest edition of the Mad Meekles podcast. This uh, this podcast, we're going to take a slight deviation and not talk about anything food related. And we thought we'd uh, hit the other center of manliness, and that is your man cave garage or your tool chest. So we're going to talk initially about shop tools. What is our essential shop tools? We're going to lay out the groundwork and we're going to start out with hand tools and then maybe migrate into some power tools and then maybe look at what the ideal shop looks like. So Shane, welcome and uh, what do you like to have in your tool chest? Well, if we're starting with the basic tools, I guess we'll start really, really basic. Hammer, saw, wrenches, crescent wrench, vice grip, just the basic hand tools, drill bits, the stuff that you, you'll use on a daily basis. Now when we get into hammers, we can get into the, all the different types of hammers, but but a basic, good, all-purpose carpenter's hammer. Hammer is probably the top of my top of my list, and I have a confession to make. This is the first time ever on a Mad Meekles podcast where I'm confessing a fetish. I love collecting hammers. It's odd. I look for them in garage sales and junk piles, and I like the shapes, the sizes. Um, I'm kind of into forging and the, some of the first stuff, even ahead of the knives, I'm like, how can I make hammers? Now, how nerdy is that? So for me, I would necessarily, my first hammer of choice would not be a carpenter's hammer. Although the claw at the back end is good and useful for general things, I would have a good one pound or two pound ball peen or cross peen hammer. Can't go without it. Yeah, and that's definitely in my tool chest as well. But I, like I said, uh, even a, an eight ounce claw hammer is a must around the farm. Yeah, oh yeah, if you're, if you're working more agriculture or you know, you're fixing fences, that kind of stuff, where you got to pull pull stuff out of stuff. Definitely, a claw hammer is well, that's what they're there for. Rather than carrying a hammer and a crowbar, you know, you got the same thing in in one tool. So yeah, that's a definite definite general purpose uh, must have in your toolbox. And you get fancier, and like I have a 20 ounce carpenter's hammer, but lots of times that's overkill for what you want. A good eight ounce is a general purpose to carry around on you when you're walking around. Like you said, just fixing little things here and there. I have a fetish for hammers too, but it's because I have to find all of them. Every time my boys <laughs> use one, they leave it out in the bush somewhere, and and I gotta find a replacement for it. So yeah, maybe we can do an upcoming podcast on how to train your children to put the tools back in the right place. That's uh, that's scope for another episode i'm sure (laughs) for me uh i i have a background in i'm an industrial electrician by trade uh so for me a healthy set of screwdrivers is is essential absolutely essential in my tool bag i wouldn't recommend myself and a you know one of those multi-bit things there's a good one out called pickwick and they're they're good they're solid and they're good hardened steel bits and that would be the only multi screwdriver i would ever ever recommend to anybody. You know, you need to have good flat blades, everything from small to wrecking bar size. A uh, good Robertson, because I'm Canadian. You know, I have to have Phillips, because everybody else uses Phillips. Uh, for you Americans, that's that's what you call a square bit. The Robertson, yeah. That was, yeah. That's the American to Canadian translation. Screwdrivers are essential from every size, from, you know, electronic screwdrivers all the way up to wrecking bar size. I've got screwdrivers for 20, 20 years that I still use. I have a good set of Westward brand wrenches. You've got to have have a, a good set of, of wrenches. I mean, you could get by with a couple of uh, adjustable spanners, press and wrenches. That's a brand, but uh, you can get by with them. But uh, there's places where you just can't use a crescent wrench, and you got to have a wrench. Screwdrivers, as you said, screwdrivers are an absolute must. I've got a set of Westward uh, screwdrivers that I've had. I bought when I was like 16 years of age. I'm still using them to this day. I trained uh, when I was younger as a sheet metal mechanic, so in my tool chest you will find a flanging pliers and tin snips. My dad's a tin basher, so I came out of the womb with those in my hand. So they're they're in my bag, that's for sure. Tin snips, I mean, it doesn't matter whether you're a sheet metal mechanic or not. You need to have tin snips around the place. They come in handy. If you're a non-person that works with metal, you use them for everything from cutting wire to you name it. I just cringe at the thought of cutting wire with my good tin snips. Yeah, well, people do it. you got to face the reality of what people do with it, not what, what you were trained to do with them. I'll tell you, there is a reason why you don't want somebody cutting wire and the like with a good set of tin snips. It's not so bad if they cut a soft copper wire with it, but they cut anything stronger than that and they're taking the edges off of the tin snip. Yeah. So when you go to cut a piece of tin, 
you're it, they're not going to cut as nicely. It's like you know, it's like when you were a kid and you stole your uh, your mom's shears out of the out of the sewing cupboard that she uses to cut fabric, and she catches you cutting you know cardboard and construction paper with them. Same sort of thing. Your mother probably called you oh, many different words that especially you... her pinking shears. Exactly. So. It's the same principle there. It dulls the edge. They're sharpened and they're hardened at a certain weight so that they cut metal at various sizes and thicknesses. And I've actually got uh, my grandfather's my grandfather's tin snips hanging up on my wall here. Three notches on them, and that was my grandpa's. So they were great. They're still even sharp, and they're probably 50, 60 years old. Used them the other day. A good pair of shears or tin snips is, a, is an essential. I would add to that aviation snips, which are basically spring-loaded tin snips, but they come in right, left, and center. Yeah. Yellow, red, and green. Those are not quite as needed, but they're in my tools toolkit as an essential. Uh, but then I do a lot of work with tin. So we're talking about hammers, screwdrivers... What about uh, saws? We need to discuss maybe how to cut some wood because not everything is done with metal these days. You know, people still use wood, believe it or not. A basic first thing that you have to have is a good all-purpose uh, buck saw. Yep. Don't get a cheap one, though. If you're going to spend a little bit of money on any of your tools, your saw should be one of them. Yeah, same same applies to a hacksaw as well. Correct. If you buy the cheapest one, uh, if you take a buck saw, you try and cut through a 2 by 4 straight with a cheap buck saw, you won't have a hope in it. It will be the most crooked cut you'd think that you had been blind making the cut. But if you have a good high tensile steel buck saw blade in a good bow, you can cut through a 2 by 4 straight as an arrow. For doing rough cuts around the place, that's good. You wouldn't want to be using that for finishing carpet. No, though. no. I, I have a detail saw that I use. It's a pull saw. It's like a Japanese style. with a really, really ultra thin kerf that's really flexible and bendable. So anything delicate or really very precise, I use that. Other than that, I have a good old-fashioned, uh, just a handsaw. Uh, of course, once again, from my grandpa. And well, I have two of Grandpa Meekle's uh, cross-cut and straight-cut saws. They're essential. They're essential. You know, for me, I don't use them very often, but boy, when you need them, you need them. A good cross-cut saw and a buck saw, and you're just about good to go. Another thing that we haven't discussed, you know, if you're going to do any work on pretty much any type of machinery, you need to have a good pair of good set of sockets, uh, ratchet and sockets. Half-inch drive, three-eighths drive, you need both of them. I would say quarter inch drive, three-eighths drive, half-inch drive, and if you're like me, I've got three-quarter inch and one-inch drives as well. Uh, I was going to say, I've never used a one-inch drive unless I'm, you know, on heavy machinery, and usually, as the electrician, I would have the millwright do that. So, I don't think that's essential for your shop, but it's definitely nice to have. <laughs> well, it depends on if, if you're... Uh, if you're working on, on big trucks, yeah, absolutely. Or a tractor. Yeah. Yep. I had to, I bought my one inch set when I needed to pull the wheel bearings on the back of my tractor. Uh, I could have got an adapter, but at the time I had found a good good deal on, on a set of one inch used, and so that's why I bought it. You can get adapters too, that's something that we yeah. should mention, so that you can run with a half inch drive. With bigger sockets. You can run bigger sockets by going up on the drive from half inch to three quarter to to one inch. For most shops, quarter inch, three eighths, and half inch. Now, uh, another thing that's another thing I think is is a good thing to have in your shop as far as while we're still on sockets. Yeah, go ahead. While we're still on sockets, almost essential uh, to go with them is torque wrenches. Yes. Yeah. Like for instance, I'm working on a motorcycle. And I need a torque wrench to make sure everything's spot on. Right. They'll come in the same. They come in three eighths, half yeah. inch, and yeah. bigger. That tells you exactly how much as it's says in the name how much torque you're putting on to tighten the bolt if you're doing like a head or something and it wants 15 foot pounds you set it and it won't let you go any farther than that for torque uh, that way you're not going to crack anything or unevenly tighten it so that you have an air leak they just are essential to have for a number of different projects yeah there's a couple of the things that i have in my toolbox that aren't power tools that are pretty much something that i use well the one tool for sure every day and that's a caliper uh, i use uh, one that's got you know inside Side measurement, outside measurement, and then depth. Uh, I use that pretty much every day. I make a lot of like tobacco smoking pipes, and it's essential for precision measurements. And, you know, anything that you need to be, you know, within thousandth or a millimeter or whatever your calipers are in, definitely, definitely, it's the best fifty bucks you'll ever spend. Well, uh, that and that's not even that expensive nope. a set. I, I have one set of calipers at three hundred and twenty yeah. bucks, but but you don't uh, need to go over. They camp. are an essential piece. Yeah, you don't need to go. You know, you don't have no, to. No, but there yeah. are some things that you you do have to have it. 
that that close of specifications. Yep. The only reason that I bought that pair is because what I was working on needed to be within such tight tolerances that you needed to have an exact yep. pair. But for the average workshop, fifty to a hundred dollars on a on a good set of calipers is all you should have to spend. Half the time I've got a cheap set that was like uh, twenty bucks that I use a lot of times. If it doesn't have to be so Precise. minute the uh, size. Yes, it's good. I agree. A good set of calipers. Uh, another thing that's handy to have locking ring pliers. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, and some of the stuff, the more, depending on what type of work you're doing in your garage or your shop, will you'll have more specialty tools. You know, there's a whole raft of chisels and that kind of thing that you need for woodworking. Oh, we could spend a show on pliers exactly. alone. Exactly. You know, if you're doing metalworking, you know, punches and chisels. You know, you, there's there's certain things that you need for different applications. Um, so as time goes on, you, you, know, you just start to collect this stuff, which moves us to power tools. There are a few essentials in your power tool department that everybody should have. If you're male or female and you like to do anything in a garage, you need to have a few tools. And one of them, right off the get-go, is a, a skill saw. You know, a powered circular saw. Definitely need one of those. Seven and a quarter inch circular saw is is a must. You know, I was in Europe, so they were a little bit different sizes, but a similar thing. You know, you could even flip them upside down, create a bench. You can make them into uh, table saws. You know, they're so versatile, so movable. You could buy a table to yeah. convert them. I mean, if you don't want to have to build the box, they have... Ridget makes a really... I, I hate to throw brands out there, but Ridget makes a beautiful table that has the switch on the front and the whole nine yards. You would think it's a table saw, except you look underneath and there's your yeah. skill saw. I would say probably right beside a skill saw would be a uh, hand drills, uh, like a power drill, uh, whether that be a cordless. I, for me personally, I have a, a 3 8 20 volt cordless uh, that I use for any sort of you know drilling, screwing, fixing the deck, whatever. And then I have a half inch drive power, corded, you know, good old old school Milwaukee that I use for pretty much anything that's bigger than that. Well, I have about 20 drills around here. They are absolute essential. But one thing I will say is one of your drills needs to have be a yeah, hammer I was drill say, too. Uh, right after that uh, was I have a I have a battery operated impact hammer drill. Yeah, as far as uh, any concrete work, it's it's a must. Particularly even in Europe where I was living, um, everything's made out of concrete, not anything out of wood. So you had to have a, a hammer drill as well. So I would say there's four kinds of drills. You need a cordless drill, you need a cord drill, you need a hammer drill, and you need an impact drill. Yeah, oh, I would agree. Very good to have around is, well, brand name, Sawzall. Yeah, reciprocating saw. Reciprocating saw is whenever you got to do renovations on anything, it makes getting through any old material lickety split and it's done. Yep, if you can't Sawzall it, you can't do it. A good Sawzall will go cut through the old nails, cut through the old wood, tin, yeah. everything. Fingers, you know, and all of the above another essential tool i think in my repertoire is uh as an angle grinder you know whether it's uh just a four and a half inch little guy or you can get the big ones but you need they're so versatile you know you can put cutting discs on them you can buy sanding flapper wheels you can buy just sanding disc wheels you can buy grinding discs wire brush attachments uh, for instance i'm working on an old retrofitting an old motorcycle and i built a new tail light and you know i did everything from cutting to shaping to brushing up and to sanding it all with the same item that is an essential for me if you're going to do any metal working definitely an essential tool yeah well a good grinder is nice to have around like i i have five grinders from four and a half to eight inch like you said if i put my uh sanding pad on i can buff out auto body work if you put the cutting wheel on i can cut steel with it you name it there they, they make a blade yeah, almost you can put it. blades for cutting stone work all of the above it's uh they're very versatile and i think it's an it's essential in a basic garage uh, shop setup so uh any any other power tools that you can think of that are basics you know i would think a, a type of sander would be a key thing if you're going to do any woodworking refinishing or anything like that you uh, i have a a belt sander that I use a fair bit and uh, like an orbital sander that I use uh, for fine work. I have jitterbugs which are air yeah. air operated uh, pad sanders. I have random orbit pad sanders. I have circular pad sanders. I have a belt sander. But you should at least have, I have detail sander, but you should at least have a basic pad sander. One basic pad sander to help you uh, when you're 
if you're doing anything it helps buff out uh, you can buff out some of it with the grinder with the right attachments and then you do the finishing to give it a glossy look with a good good sander yeah. other than that one thing I would say is if we're gonna move over to to the bench there's a few essential things that I think should have yeah on that's bench. true yeah, we forgot that and one of them's and one of them is even not a power tool we need to have a good vice yes uh definitely need a good vice vices there's there's a straight job vice and then you got your yep. pipe vices i like to have both of them in my shop one other thing is if go back to the woodworking it sure is handy to have a chop saw oh like a miter saw yeah miter saw chop saw yeah if you're gonna spend the money on it get one with a with a laser yeah, sight on those it are great. they're not much more expensive and it makes all the difference to make sure you get the cut exactly where you want it uh a good bench grinder yep and you can change uh, one that's interchangeable so you can put on you know buffing wheels and all uh, all those sorts of things well that that's why i like one that's got yep. double head so you can have a, a fine stone like for for sharpening i don't use it much for sharpening knives except when when i'm re-edging an outdoor knife you can put an edge on it and then buff it out on the buffer if you got multi ends you can have a buffing wheel on one yep. side and a grinding wheel on the other absolutely or you can change out the buffing wheel for uh, for a wire wheel so that you can clean something that's really rusty you can clean it up in no time very handy to have a bench grinder we something that isn't absolutely necessary but is sure handy to have around is a welder now there's many kinds of welders but a basic acdc stick welder yeah. is very handy to have around for repairing things i happen to have a stick welder a mig welder and a spot welder yeah and with, and with mig welders you can get uh flux core welders as well so you don't need to have the argon or or the gas like shielding gas right and i actually have a flux core welder but my next purchase will be a gas welder black gas mig yeah they're great having trained on on a gas mig they're there i like them better than a flux core but in a pinch a flux core will do the job and the advantage that you have with a flux core is 99 percent to flux cores are 100 yeah they're small little guys and they're portable and they're easy to easy to weld with and you don't have to try and find a 220 outlet so that uh, brings us down to maybe kind of some of of our ideas deal shops look like you know i just moved back to canada and uh had to give up all my uh my whole shop i had a specific shop that i would teach guys how to build stuff and i had it kitted out really well now i don't have it so my ideal shop you know there's a there's two tools that i think should be in every ideal shop if you're going to do anything design building you know we kind of think it yourself and if you need to think it yourself you need to have these two tools to to produce what you're thinking and they are a drill press and a lathe with a, I use both of those all the time when I lived overseas and if I thought it I thought oh I can build that put it popped it on the lathe and away I went I had a, a small metal lathe that I uh, I built a set of jaws for for holding wood and yeah I used it at higher speeds for wood lower speeds for metal you know, I, I loved it it's the best you know best tool I had in the shop to be honest drill press is just an essential thing and I would agree with you that both of them and a drill press you in a pinch you can use it for machining yeah. as well put something in the in the into the jaw and uh, you can do a little bit of metal turning and the like so i would say that the a drill press even before a lathe, because you can do some of the things that you can do on a lathe with the with the drill press i would add a couple well, of, i would add uh, a i would add a welder on my there dream well, shop but, yeah but we've yeah. already talked about the welder but I would be lost without my brake. I do a lot of stuff with tin. If I didn't have a brake to bend the, the metal, yeah. I would be lost. I, I like to have yeah, my a set, of, set of rollers. I just have yeah. a small, cheap. I don't have a big finger brake. With it, you can custom make guards and everything else when you're repairing something. It's just really handy to have around. So there's kind of three uh, yeah. mediums that you work in in a shop, you know, if you're designing and building and you can outfit your shop accordingly you know woodworking or metalworking or you know the third one is plastics um there's some specific stuff you need for that as well chemicals etc but for me i kind of like have an all-purpose shop for all three so i add a 3d printer on there now a lot there's a lot of hype around 3d printers and they're finicky and they don't work the best all the time but if you want to prototype an idea and you can draw, a 3D printer is a kind of a great thing. And you can buy kits on, you know, do-it-yourself stuff and make your own 3D printer. And I did that and it works great. I've got mine sitting up here and it works great. It works great. Now, the thing is with a 3D printer, you got to be careful with uh, other contaminants in the shop, i.e. sawdust and metal dust. Uh, so you need to have kind of an enclosed area where you uh, where you can store it. But other than that, yeah, you can create yourself an all-purpose shop and design, build. You know, laser cutters and all those kind of things are fun. Well, see, but... one of the advantages that I see to having a, a 3D printer is 
like for me I do a lot of repairing and stuff and fixing things up and I really like restoring stuff and the thing is is if you can't find a, a knob or something like that nice having a 3d printer you can just print it off yep. there's a lot of finishing work you need to do at yeah there's a lot of finishing work you have to do at the end with your 3d printer but uh, after having spent money, built one, played with it, you know, and finished them, uh, yeah, any shop I have will have a 3D printer in it. And they're pretty simple to set up. Yeah, and the thing is, is and they're not that hard to build with following, there's there's a ton of uh, instructions online on, on building your own. So you don't have to go out and spend a thousand bucks on a 3D printer. You can build one for two to three hundred dollars. The thing, the thing is, is calibration. Calibration, calibration, calibration. That's the thing with the 3D printer. Once you get it set up, then it'll print like a dream. And you can now uh, get multi-heads on it, so you can print in many different kinds of plastics. Yep. You can get more hard plastics for knobs. Yeah, generally soft generally in the home market, things. there's two types of plastics that they use primarily. Uh, PLA, which is a vegetable base. And ABS. And the nice thing is, is you can also, with ABS, the advantage to ABS is that you can glue things together after yep. you print them as well. And that makes a big difference too. So if you have a very complicated design, you can uh, print out several pieces and then glue them together. And Generally, I, if I pr initial prototype something, I'll do it in PLA plastic because you don't need the, the temperatures lower and you don't have to worry about uh, more of a controlled environment as it cools, it doesn't warp, etc. So any initial design I'll do in a PLA. And then uh, if I want to do anything that's like solid that I, let's say I give to a friend, you know, whatever, then I'll fin do a, another copy of that ABS and, and then work it that way. That's how I generally roll with it. The other nice thing about ABS is that you it's easy to paint it too. So if you want to change the color, you paint it yep. in white, you can paint it what, however you want it, uh, and it holds the paint very well. Yeah, I think that uh, just about wraps it up. And this, you know, the only other thing I could mention is maybe, you know, you get all these tools, how do you, uh, how do you store them all? You know, there's multiple shelving solutions and we could talk for hours on that uh, for me I went the uh, you know I couldn't afford 10 grand for rolling cabinets you know the fancy mechanics cabinets so what I did is I went to the second hand store and I got a bunch of old filing cabinets really heavy duty I added some plywood on the bottom some rolling wheels and uh, I got like five of them in my garage and they hold all my tools and they were great so for a hundred bucks I'm kitted out it's it's awesome so you know you got to find a good solution that works for you to store all your tools uh, other than that you know you need a good bench and, and away you can go. Start designing, guys. That's, you know, think it yourself, do it yourself. That's the kind of the motto. Yeah, anything else? And I would make one other recommendation on storage, and that is that you make a spot for each tool, and you actually mark out where that tool belongs so that you know when something's missing. You have people that come, and they... They use your tools or whatever, and if it's you go and take a look, the hammer's not where it's supposed to be. You know to go chasing after that person to get it back because even though tools in and of themselves aren't expensive, they add up very quickly to becoming quite oh, yeah. expensive. You can have quite easily hundreds and hundreds of dollars into tools pretty fast. I, I was going to say thousands and you thousands. can, yeah. But in on initial on initial setup, you know. You're, you're looking at a few hundred dollars just to even blink at tools. Buy the, here's the thing, when it comes to tools, buy the best you can afford. That's my only advice. Buy the best you can afford. I would agree. Uh, and that doesn't mean that it has to be the most expensive. It's the yep. best you can afford. Don't, unless you know what you're doing, I would also state in there, don't modify a tool. Yep. Unless you know what you're doing. More people have been injured by modified tools than anything Particularly, else. Particularly uh, lathes, grinders, uh, anything that is abrasive and cutting. Not a good thing. Don't try and make your own chisel. Don't try to do that type yeah, of thing. Yeah, unless you have some experience, yeah. Exactly. Yeah. That's, what I, yeah. that's why I said at the beginning there, unless you know what you're doing, don't try to do it because you make something to do something that it's not supposed to and it's going to break and you're yep. going to get hurt so on that positive note do you have anything else you wanted to add to the ideal shop list or to any essential tools that we've talked about uh we could talk for hours and hours and hours on on tools but i think uh we've given a basic uh overview of some basic tools that every shop should have okay well then i guess it's time to sign off for this podcast and uh we'll see you on the flip side guys yeah, yeah see you next episode yeah.